And if you're not eating enough protein, chances are you're not going to make enough muscle and therefore you're not going to gain that muscle that you want in order to burn the fat that you need to burn. Hey, my name is Leanne Vogel. I'm fascinated with helping women navigate how to eat, move, and care for their bodies using a low-carb diet. I'm a small-town holistic nutritionist turned three-time international best-selling author turned functional medicine practitioner, offering telemedicine services around the globe to women looking to better their health and stop second-guessing themselves. I'm here to teach you how to wade through the wellness noise to get to the good stuff that'll help you achieve your goals. We're supporting your low-carb life beyond the if-it-fits-your-macros conversation. Hormones, emotions, relationship to your body, workouts, letdowns, motivation, blood work, detoxing, metabolism. I'm providing the tools to put your motivation into action. Think of it like quality time with your bestie mixed with a little med school so you're empowered at your next doctor visit. Get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn about your body and how to care for it better. This is the Keto Diet Podcast. Hello, hello. I hope you are having a great day, whatever you are up to. I am fresh from the gym. It was an upper day. I totally crushed it, came home, ate all the foods, had a shower. And before I do anything else today, I'm going to sit down with you and chat about macros, working out, what I've discovered of the last eight months of consistently working out. Now, if you missed the first episode in this series, it's episode 410, where we're talking about working out and what I've discovered over committing to this and being consistent, what has shifted. It's really just a journey that I am on figuring out as I go using what I know from my previous life being a triathlete and really trying to get back into the groove of what it means to move my body in a healthy way. So if you haven't checked out episode 410 from February 28th, go ahead and listen to that one after this, because in there we're talking about how to make a commitment to working out. So if you're listening to today's episode and you are not consistently working out, like maybe you have a goal of working out every day and you are not doing that, maybe you're doing once a week, or maybe you have a goal of walking every day, but you skip a bunch of days. Episode 410 from February 28th is really great for that, where I'm really breaking down how I started making the commitment. Yes, me, a girl who absolutely hates working out. I hate the gym. I hated doing it. I didn't want to do it. It was a full six months of not wanting to do it. And I am really excited to say I actually wake up and I want to go to the gym and I'm kind of getting into this groove where it feels good and I enjoy it. So if you're not there yet, episode 410 is totally for you. So go ahead and check that out. It's called Workout Commitment Made Easy. So today I wanted to chat about all things food. You guys submitted some really good questions. We're going to get to those in a moment. We really haven't done a lot of Q&A episodes. That's actually how the Keto Diet Podcast got started, was a bunch of different Q&A episodes, and you guys would submit it if you're from way, way, way back then. Oh my goodness, we've made it to episode 414. How is that even possible? Wow. So I want to first preface the different types of workouts and the different types of humans. Okay, so I am a relatively healthy individual. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Uh, I've been through a bunch of things, but I've been given a second chance understanding that my default is deficiency. So I had an eating disorder when I was quite young, and that really set the tone for my body to be in a deficient state. So where I say, you know, I'm really happy to be eating more, that might not be your story, rather. You may come from a place of an excess state, meaning when you were a child, there was too much food, there was too much you know, junk that you were eating and all those things. So we need to understand the type of human that we are and the base that we have, okay? And I think what's missing a lot of the times is having that conversation, right? I come from a fairly slim family. That's also really important to understand. My parents were both really athletic as young people, and my dad can grow muscle. He's in his 70s. He was chatting with me the other day, and he was like, yeah, I went down, I ran down the ski hill seven times in 15 minutes, right? So 
that these are these are my genetics. And I think that that's really, 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 really important to start off with because oftentimes, you know, when we're on YouTube or we're listening to podcasts about this sort of stuff, we're like, why can't why can't I do that? Why can't my body look like this? And I think it's just really important to understand where people have come from and what the limitations are on their body. Another piece I want to cover is my glucose is relatively stable and I have pretty good insulin sensitivity. Now, it wasn't always like that. When I came to the ketogenic diet, oh my goodness, I was a hot wreck metabolically. That was in 2014. I used the ketogenic diet to get my period back. I'd been on it for a bunch of years. I started doing carb ups to help with my metabolism and my sleeping, and that helped a whole bunch. I discovered parasites, worked through that. I'm still doing root cause work on the side of this. Right now, I'm continuing to detox arsenic only because, and we'll get to this probably talking about the types of foods that I'm eating. I'm eating protein powder, and protein powder is definitely not the best. That is for sure. And so I know this going into it, and so I'm detoxing from the things that might be in the foods that I'm eating. And of course, I'm trying to choose the best, best options, but we live in a toxic world, so that's always going to be in the back of my mind. And so if you are currently detoxing, perhaps you have mold illness or you are going through a parasite protocol, or maybe you're in my root cause group where I guide people through how to do all of this. Now is probably not the time to be adjusting your macros and hitting the gym hardcore. Not that your maybe your body can handle it, but probably not. And also it's a lot of priorities, right? My drainage pathways are fully open. I'm sweating. I'm pooping. My pee is on point. My breath is on point, whereas it wasn't before. And so I'm saying all of this just to make sure that you know where your headspace needs to be, because we share a lot here on the podcast. We have lots of different guests and opinions and experiences, and I'm going through things personally, and I'm seeing things in clients that I want to share. And so I have a lot of input that I'm just giving out to you, right? That's And so you get to pixie and choosy about the things that I'm sharing. And yeah, so without further ado, let's kind of like get into my workouts my macros, what I was doing previously, and kind of just go through the whole thing. I'll probably read out some of the days of what I've been eating recently to kind of give you an idea. So August 3rd, 2022, I decided enough is enough. I got to start working out. And so in episode 410, we kind of went through what that process was like. At that time, as I was starting to work out, I did not change my macros. I continued to eat my wonderful ketogenic diet, My macros at that point, when I was doing a little bit of high-intensity interval training, biking, walking, maybe doing about 30 minutes of activity per day, I changed nothing with these macros. So my carbs were 10%, which worked out to be 40 grams net carbs. My protein was 25%, which worked out to be 105 grams of protein. My fat was 65%, which worked out to be 115 grams of fat. And that worked out to be about 1,612 calories. Of course, there were days where like I didn't hit that, especially a couple of days before my cycle. I get so ravenously hungry and I've just learned that if I don't embrace that and just allow myself to eat, I am the worst person to be around. And so like three or so days right before my cycle, I usually blow through those macros. And how I was tracking at that point is, Maybe once a week, I would write down what I ate that day. And then at the end of the day, I would sit down with my fitness pal and go through what I ate and what that was looking like. And then I would make shifts and adjustments for the following week. So around this time, Lumen reached out to me about trying their doohickey. Like, I don't even know what to call it. It's like a breath analyzer that analyzes CO2 in your breath to determine how many carbs you're burning or how much fat you're burning. I didn't find it to be overly helpful, like, at all. I did a lot of experiments over months to try to figure out, like, how it did what it did. And I think when you're in an acidic state, you're going to process CO2 differently. I totally get that. But, for example, if you are in mold, your CO2 is going to be different, If you're in a stressful state that has nothing to do with the food you're eating, your CO2 is going to be different. So 
I would eat really high, like super high carb meals. And then an hour later, it would tell me I was in fat burning. I'm like, no, that's not even possible. Or I would eat ketogenic for three solid days. And then I would have a really nice sleep, wake up in the morning, and it would say that I was burning carbohydrates. So that thing, what I did really like about Lumen as I was discovering macros and all the things is it really encouraged me to eat more. And so I think that that tool could be super helpful if you are in, again, going back to that state. Are you in a deficient state or are you you in an excess state? Because that's really, really important to understand about yourself. And I think you should be able to answer that question based on your history. But if you're unsure and you work with a practitioner, 100% they'll be able to tell you. And so I found with Lumen, I was able to encourage myself to eat more and knew that it wasn't a big deal. And so that was part of the process for me. I just didn't find the tool to be overly helpful or based in any science. Now, they do mention that they have some peer-reviewed study. I read it. Eh, I don't know. It just, it just, it just didn't make sense to me 100%. And so, yeah, take it or leave it. I would leave it. But again, it encouraged me to eat more. So I was really eating these macros, 10% carbs, 25% protein, 65% fat, and doing really well at around 1,600 calories, give or take, around my cycle. And again, this was me doing HIIT workouts, lighter stuff, cycling, walking, that sort of thing. And that was good, right? You guys are familiar with how we do the ketogenic diet around here. The reason why I chose 40 grams of net carbs was because net carbs are important to me because I love fiber and you should love it too. And plant diversity. So let's talk about the diversity of plants on your ketogenic diet for a moment. You need to eat the colors of the rainbow. So, so important. In fact, we chatted about this in an episode with Dr. E, episode 412, labeled Fatigue Since 2020. So check that out if you need some inspiration around diversity, and I'll cover that here as well. So around this time also, because we were back stateside, which makes it a lot easier to eat well as opposed to in the Bahamas where literally I... I have cried when I've seen a bushel of kale before in the Bahamas because it had been like months since I'd seen anything green and I was so excited. I'm not exaggerating. So very, very, very different, very different. And so I really made it a goal during this time while I was eating 40 grams of net carbs and starting to work out more and starting to move my body to bring in more diversity of the plants that I was eating. And so Every couple of weeks, I would add in a couple new plants like kohlrabi or bok choy or uh, what was it, parsnips and just new things that I had never tried before. Praise the Lord. Now that I am through a lot of the mold stuff, I'm able to handle more nightshades. So I started with a little bit of tomatoes. I still can't do bell peppers. They still give me acne. But just adding this variety and getting really comfortable with those ingredients, how to incorporate them. And so now I'm up to about 30 different plants that I'm eating on a weekly basis. And I know that sounds like totally bizarre. Like, how do you even? It's really not that hard. When you go to the grocery store, you just get one serving of each plant, right? And it is very easy, actually, once you move your way up to get that variety into your diet. And then once a week, you're eating these 30 plants that you purchased, right? So maybe it's one clamshell of blueberries and a cantaloupe and an orange and an onion and garlic and bok choy and kale and kohlrabi. And I mean, already I've listed, oh, what is that? Six or seven items, strawberries, apples, cucumbers, zucchini. And then you just add this variety and trying new things and fresh herbs count. So like a big thing of basil and making some pesto. So you get the idea. So that's what I was doing during that time is really getting into that fat burning zone. And because it was high intensity interval training. So let's talk about the differences between aerobic and anaerobic activities. So aerobic activities generally are going to burn fat. Okay. So think of the marathon runner that's running a full marathon. Now I've done this. I've done this glucose fueled. I haven't totally done it fat fueled. I would love at some point to be able to run again. We're not there yet. We are years away from this, but that's a goal that I definitely have in the back of my mind. It would be so epic to be able to do that again, but I know my health can't handle it. And so think of this runner. They are running off of fat. 
It is a long-term fat. It is a slow and steady burn. So anytime you're in that aerobic place, these long, steady pushes, you're probably going to burn fat. Now, on the flip side, anaerobic, it's a glucose fueled activity. And so because I was doing HIT high intensity interval training, it's generally a glucose fueled activity, but it's short bursts, really short bursts. Okay. So I felt pretty confident with the short bursts that I was doing. I was eating just enough carbohydrates in order to blow through those and really get into a ketogenic state. Now, everyone's a little bit different. Some people find like with high intensity interval training, if they're doing it too much, they do need carbohydrates. I personally am of the opinion that high intensity interval training should not be done more than like two or three times per week. And so once I started doing more and more and more of those Nourish Move Love videos, which I was talking about in the last episode, 410, I just realized like this wasn't working for the goals that I set or the macros that I wanted. And it just wasn't working for the results that I wanted. So then I shifted up my training schedule and started actually going to the gym. Okay. So my training schedule at the time was abs, upper, hamstrings, and glutes, break, upper, quads, break. Okay. So I had two days off. And I was working five, uh, working out five days a week. And during that time, I was also doing, I was trying to get to 10,000 steps. Okay, so that was really the goal. Really, 10,000 steps for me is about an hour and a half to an hour and 45 minutes of walking a day, which is crazy. It is so hard to get in. I still haven't like totally mastered it. I have long periods of time where I hit it. And then I'm like, dude, how did I even do that before? Okay, so at that point, I started playing around with increasing my carbohydrates. So again, when I was doing abs, which was one day a week, I was adding a little bit of cardio. Okay. So again, it was abs, cardio, upper hams and glutes, break, upper quads, and then off. Okay. With my macros at that point, I started shifting away from the 10% carbs, 25% protein and 65% fat moving a lot of my fat over to protein. I kept my carbs like maybe a little bit higher around like 50 grams net, maybe 60 grams net on like really heavy days. Like anytime I was doing a leg workout, man, I don't know about you, but when I focus on my legs, it crushes me. Upper, not so much. Upper I can do. And so I would have an upper day, like an upper push day and then an upper pull day. And it worked out really well, but I I find I didn't really need many carbohydrates. So on days where I was doing my upper workout, which was two days a week, I didn't really change my carbohydrates at all, kept it pretty the same. Then on days where I had my hams and glutes or my quad days, so hams and glutes is one day, quads is another day, and there's a little bit of glutes in there too because, you know, we want to grow our glutes, right? So on those days, I would take even more fat and move it over to carbs, okay? So my first... Your first goal, anyone's first goal when you start working out and when you start lifting is increasing your protein. Like without a doubt, 1 billion percent, your focus needs to be on protein. So if you remember, my protein amount was 25%, which was 105 grams of carbs. I am 160-ish pounds. My weight, I'm not really good at checking my weight. I really don't care about it. And so I really should have tracked it from the very beginning, but I literally don't care about weight. I just want to feel good and be tighter. So however weight, like I don't care about my weight. I could be 200 pounds if that means that I feel tighter and feel good. I really don't care. So if that's all muscle, we are good to go. And so with my protein, I worked up to one gram of protein per pound that I weigh. So that worked out to be like 160. I would just aim for like 160, 170, okay? That took me a while to just get in the groove with that. It is so hard to eat that much protein when you first get started. Just like if you remember when you first got started with your ketogenic diet, remember how hard it was to hit your fat macro? Oh, that was so hard. So again, I just took away some of the fat and moved it over to the protein. And so that was my first goal as I started moving and grooving and lifting weights, okay? So I have two days off, I'm working five days in the gym, I'm doing abs, cardio one day, 
upper push the other day, hams and glutes the next day. Then I have a day off. Then I'm doing upper pull and then quads and a little bit of glutes and then another day off. Okay. So again, those, those heavy leg days, you bet I'm going to take even more of that fat and I'm going to move it over to the carbs. And this is a a point that I want to drive home in today's episode. Your macros do not need to be static. Like sit down, open up a macro calculator and figure out a couple of scenarios. Okay. What is a high protein day going to look like for you? What is a low carb day going to look like for you? What's a high carb day going to look like for you? Because if you are really pushing it and you just find like you need those carbohydrates, especially on leg days, like I, my leg days, I am like, give me all of the carbs, then do that. Like a hundred percent do that. And also they don't need to be static throughout the day. So that's the next point I want to cover. So what I started doing is I started working out primarily in the morning and I would eat my breakfast, which was going to be higher in carb, lower in fat, high in protein. I would go to the gym. I would come home. Then I would eat another high carb, high protein, low fat meal. And then the next meal and for the rest of the day, it would be really low carb, high protein, high fat. And I did that for a couple of months, guys, like just getting in the groove of dialing in my carbohydrates more into the morning, right? So that really, realistically, if if you are a fat burning machine and you've been following me for a little while and you've been eating a ketogenic diet and you're on the same kind of process of, of using your macros well and timing them well and understanding your metabolic limitations, like I said from the beginning, if you have insulin resistance or diabetes and your doctor has said, do not eat carbohydrates, this strategy is not for you. What could be for you is increasing your protein for sure. What could be for you is adjusting those carbohydrates on days where you find you don't, you don't have a lot of pushing at the gym, like where you're really pushing yourself to the max, you can probably go pretty low carb. You might even be able to fast through that workout, right? And then, and then start eating when you get home, like those sorts of things. There are so many dials that you can play around with or levers that you can pull up and down, right? So you have your carb lever, you have your fat lever, you have your protein lever, which I would, or do you say lever? I never know. Lever, lever, same thing, right? With the protein, I would I would definitely keep it at at least 0.8 grams to one grams per pound of body weight. So if you weigh 150 pounds, you're eating 150 grams of protein. If you weigh 200 pounds, you're eating 200 grams of protein. Usually there's a limit to this. My understanding is that it maxes out around 225. Everyone's a little bit different on that, but I think that that's like more than enough protein that one would need. Okay, so really the key here and understanding your fat burning capacity is balancing out between how much do I need to eat to stay balanced? How much protein do I need to generate muscles? Because when we have those muscles, they're doing the fat burning for us. So that's really important. How many carbohydrates we need to feel regenerated? And then the fat just encourages that fat burning mode. And this is different for everyone. If you have tools like a ketone breath monitor, that's super helpful. If you really want to get into that fat burning state, yes. When you calculate your cardio amount, this can be really important. For me, I find that if I keep my beats per minute around 130, 135, there's like a fat burning zone to your heart rate. That's where mine is. And so on my cardio days, I'm keeping it around that level in order to maintain a fat burning state. So I'm doing that twice a week. Also with your step goals or your activity, that is your fat burning zone also. So if it means doing less weights or less like structured workouts and more walking, you're far better off generally in a fat burning goal to go toward the step goal rather than the workout goal. Another piece, like I mentioned previously, is the muscle generation. And that's where the protein comes in. If you're not eating enough protein, chances are you're not going to make enough muscle. And therefore, you're not going to gain that muscle that you want in order to burn the fat that you need to burn. Okay. So that's another piece to this is making sure when it comes to the goal of burning fat, 
How are we creating muscle to burn that fat for us? Metabolic function is important here. If you're eating 1,200 calories a day and working out, say, five or six days a week, probably your metabolic rate is very much suffering, your metabolism is broken, and you're not going to lose fat at that point. So first, you need to upregulate your metabolism. Some people call it refeeding. So that can be really important for you, a refeed time to get your metabolism where it needs to be in order to start actually burning fat because you can only lower your calories so much until there's nothing left to move. And then the fat macro. So this is a challenging one and is really dependent on so many different factors. For me right now, I'm finding that but this is by no means a low fat program. 24% fat is not low fat at all. I'm still eating 70 grams of fat. It works out to be like 15 grams or so at every meal, which I find is sufficient for right now. Just enough for me to be satiated, but not so much that I'm adding to my calories in that way is what I'm doing right now. But if you are first starting off with your ketogenic diet and learning how to burn fat, your best strategy for burning fat on your ketogenic diet is to make sure that you're eating enough and you're doing at least two HIIT workouts a week. That is a glucose burning process and walking a whole bunch. And then on top of that, starting to build the muscle. And if you think of those priorities primarily as you start working out with your goal of full-on fat burning beast mode, then you'll get a lot farther in the process than you will just focusing on how much fat can I eat to get into a fat burning state? Because I've said this, I've said this so many times. We want to eat enough fat to encourage our body in a ketogenic state, but not so much that your body's like, well, we're getting all this fat. Why do we need to burn the fat? And so I find that when I first got started with keto, I needed a really high fat macro to really encourage my body to get into the zone. But over time, I've been able to lower the fat while consistently burning fat. So if your goal is fat burning and you've been at this ketogenic diet thing for a while, try replacing some of the fat with protein and see how you go with that and see if that can help you hit your goals better. Maybe you've heard of how awesome reishi can be at help lowering your DHEA. Elevated DHEA symptoms include hair loss, male pattern baldness, hertzuism, which is excessive amounts of coarse hair where men would typically grow hair on the face, chest, or back, oily skin, acne, mood changes, aggression, irritability, weight gain, trouble sleeping, or how reishi has been shown to reduce free cortisol. These symptoms can include hypothyroid symptoms, anxiety, depression, brain fog, confusion, forgetfulness, difficulty focusing, digestive issues, bloating, gas, maldigestion, weight gain, muscle loss, sleep problems, sex hormone imbalance, PMS, frequent colds or infections. Maybe I just listed you and you're like, how do I, maybe I've tried reishi, it didn't work, maybe it's not for me. No, 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 no. Not all reishi products are created equal, and that's why I personally choose Organo Ganoderma Spore Powder. Organo has been the leading name in the natural health industry for years, and their Ganoderma Spore Powder is no exception. Here's what sets it apart from other reishi products on the market. It's made with only the highest quality spores, which are carefully harvested and processed to ensure maximum potency. This one is super important. I remember trying reishi for the first time and being like, yeah, I don't know. I could take it or leave it. Then trying spore powder about two years ago. And wow, what a difference to my adrenals. I no longer get up and get dizzy or have issues at the gym with energy issues. It's just not a problem anymore. Now it's also produced using advanced extraction technology, which helps to preserve the full spectrum of beneficial compounds found in the mushroom. It's also certified organic. The company is committed to sustainable farming practices that protect the environment. It also comes in easy to use packets in the case of King Coffee. And unlike many other reishi products, Organo's Ganoderma Spore Powder has a pleasant nutty flavor and it's easily incorporated um, whether you take the capsules or the powdered products in the case of the King Coffee. 
Either way, Organo has the options. So if you want to learn more about Ganoderma Spore Powder, aka Reishi, in the capsules or the coffee blend and how I use them, head on over to healthfulpursuit.com slash spore. That's H-E-A-L-T-H-F-U-L-P-U-R-S-U-I-T.com slash spore. Again, that's healthfulpursuit.com slash spore. I'll see you there. As I started adjusting things and my training schedule got more intense, right now I am in my sixth week of like bulking mostly. So I'm doing Wednesday is abs and cardio, Thursdays are uppers, Friday is hams and glutes, Saturday is abs with cardio. Sunday is upper, Monday is quads, and then I have Tuesdays off so I can go to Bible study. Love, love that I took Tuesdays off. Okay, so now my macros are, don't freak out. It's okay. We're going to be okay. We're going to get through this. My carbs are 38%, which is 198 grams of carbohydrates. Guys, I have not eaten this many carbs in a very long time. Like, I don't even know. I honestly don't even know that in my life I've had that many carbs. That's that's a total lie. I have, but not like how I'm doing it now. So I'll explain. And then protein, I'm sitting at 32%, which is 166 grams. I consistently go over this. I'm usually sitting at 170 to 175. And then fat, ooh, this has been hard to do, at 24%, which is 69 grams for me. So that works out to be 2,077 calories. At this point, you're probably wondering, Leanne, how are you getting this dialed in? I know that in the past you've said tracking is so triggering for you. How are you doing this? Okay. Wow. When you, okay, I should say when I, because I come from more of a deficient state, which is what we talked about previously, I'm from that deficient space, my default is not eating. If I get stressed, well, sometimes if I get stressed, I will literally eat an entire bag of chicken chips. If you haven't had them already, you must from wild. They're so good. Or like a bag of cereal. So I do have those moments where I'm like stressed and eating just feels good, especially when it comes to tax time. I absolutely hate taxes like everybody and it just stresses me out. So I eat. So I definitely have a default to that. But generally speaking, like if I get busy with work, I'll just forget to eat. My sister's the same way. Be like, what did you have today? She's like, a bowl of ramen for dinner. <laughs> That's like all. So we definitely took, got that from our mom probably. And so what I've enjoyed about tracking this go around, especially at 2,077 calories, for me, that is so much food. That is more food than I've probably eaten consistently like in a really long time. And so for me, I actually get to eat more than I would without tracking So whereas in the past, I can remember multiple times where I was running, I was crossfitting, I was like doing brick workouts in the morning. So I would wake up around 5 a.m., go to the gym, get on the bike, do an hour ride, then go into the pool, do an hour swim, go to work. And then at lunch, I would run for 45 minutes an hour. And then when I got home, I would do like my stretching. And I remember that I was on a 1500 calorie plan. No wonder I lost my period. No wonder I was like a total mess and I had acne all over my face and my joints hurt all the time. Like I wasn't eating. And so for me to be moving in this way where I'm walking about an hour and a half ish, or my goal is to walk a hundred, a hundred, an hour and a half about each day. And then I'm lifting for about 30 minutes, six days a week. I find that the 2000 calories, at least for now is where I feel comfortable with. I could definitely see myself increasing this over time, but this is just where I feel most comfortable. I find that with tracking, I'm meal prepping more. So, you know, my strategy is at night after I've eaten dinner, I'll sit down with my fitness pal and I'll just kind of like plan out my next day. What do I need? What what do I have available? What can I make with that? And kind of like dial in my macros the night before. So when I wake up and I get going with my day, I already have the day planned out for me and food is already prepared and it's just so much easier for me with a busy, busy life and making sure that I'm eating. And because of this, I'm having more sit down meals. Like I cannot tell you how many times in consultations or between my consults, I give myself like five minutes to like stretch and grab some water. I would just like grab a Paleo Valley stick, which I love. I love, love, love. But to eat those for lunch instead of an actual meal, not so great. 
And I find that I'm eating a bunch more plants because of this, because I sit down, I plan my meal the night before, and I'm like, ooh, I could add kale to that. Oh, I could add a cucumber to that. Oh, I have some extra carbs. I'm going to add an orange there. And so I just find like with the planning, I'm able to eat so many more plants. Okay. So you're probably totally freaking out. Like can, there, you're like, can we backtrack? Uh, Leanne, you just said you were eating 198 grams of carbs. What the heck? This is a keto diet podcast. What are you doing? How is this possible? You're so irresponsible. I totally get it. <laughs> I totally get it. I love the ketogenic diet. I, I mean, I have a big smile on my face just thinking about how incredible a tool this is and how incredibly thankful I am that I discovered this tool for myself at a time where I really needed it, that it's in my toolbox, that I use it on my days off. So again, those levers, levers that I was talking about on my days off, it is a full ketogenic day. I just enjoy all the fats and it is deliciously perfect. I'll usually wake up and fast for a little bit, then eat all the fats and just continue until I go to bed. So I'm still using the ketogenic diet. Also, this is just one portion of my training where I find I'm requiring it. But after this 12-week set, I'm planning to do something a little bit different where I'll go back into more of a fat burning state and try to cut a little bit before I go back into a bulk. And so we need to understand that all these things are just tools, right? Like there's nothing right or wrong understanding that my default is deficiency and my insulin sensitivity is pretty on point at this point. It wasn't before. Like the ketogenic diet did what I needed it to do and continues to do what I needed to do for the goals that I have. But I think what a lot of us get caught up on is like, but every day needs to look exactly the same. Otherwise I won't succeed. Yes, there's there's a level of that, 100%. Like what we were talking about in the last episode, episode 410 about consistency. You can plan to have a goal of working out every day, totally make that goal. But are you actually doing it? Because if you're not, then like your goal sucks. And that was that was my life. I'd be like, yeah, yeah, I'll change my food. I'll get this going. And then I just wouldn't work out. And then I'd be eating like not the right things for what I was doing. And so we need to be consistent, 100%. And these are baby steps. We are having this conversation with me almost eight months into this process. I really want to drive it home. If you're new to this and you're eating a ketogenic diet and you just want to move more, don't change your macros. Just get started. And you will know, you will feel. And if you don't, maybe you need to hire somebody so that they know and they can guide you in this to understand when it's time to shift your macros. Okay? So, yeah, eating that many carbs was really hard the first couple of days. Actually, that's a lie. It was like a, a couple of weeks and I still have my moments. I know that this won't last forever only because I do notice that my brain isn't as on point. One of the reasons why I kept going with a ketogenic diet is because I have some ADD slash ADHD situation in my brain and it's just a little bit harder for me to focus when I have carbohydrates. I have found that if I move the carbohydrates to when I'm working out, remember I was saying like a carb meal in the morning, working out, then a carb meal and then keto for the rest of the day. I found that that kept my brain pretty good. But the carbohydrates throughout the day or if my carbohydrates, oh, I actually have this on my tracker because I wrote it down which is so incredibly perfect to do. If my carbs go like above 45 grams for the meal, like 45, 50 grams for the meal, I know that my brain is going to suffer. And so I really, another take home piece that I want you to understand is like, just because one thing is bad at a certain level, like carbohydrates, for example, doesn't mean that a little bit lower of a level won't, will be bad too. Okay, so I know that if I eat like 60 grams of carbs in one meal, it's not going to be a good situation for my brain. But again, if I keep it around like 45, I find I'm okay. And understanding too that this is just a season where I'm at, where I'm just discovering, can my body do this? Do I experience better gains because of this? What is my goal? Is my goal to eat high fat or is my goal to feel great and see what my body can do? Right now, my goal is to feel great and see what my body can do. So I really don't care if that's high fat, medium fat, high protein, like whatever, whatever it is. 
And I think another thing is checkpoints, right? So I know that if I lose my cycle, <laughs> I've gone too far, back up the bus, and we, we, need to, we need to go back, like back, 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 right? So that's for me. So again, my current macros are 38% carbs, 32% protein, and 24% fat. Really, everything kind of spinning around the protein piece at one gram per pound of body weight. So again, for me, that's around like 166-ish. Like again, I I really need to get better at weighing myself. I probably need, I don't even want to buy a scale. I just, I used to obsess about my weight so much and I understand that it's important for this process. I just can't and I just won't. So there's a scale at the, the gym and I use it like once a week. But I don't know how accurate it is. I don't think it's been serviced in a really long time because sometimes I'll go on there, it says I'm 140 pounds and other times it's like 160. So I'm like, which one is it? I know I'm not 140, so I'm gonna go with 160. But, um, you know, like I'm 5'10". And so I'm like, nah, I I think it's probably the 160. So that's to do with all of the macro stuff. I hope you got something out of that. Why don't I read through a little bit of my tracker. Why don't we do like yesterday? I also had tracking. Let's see if I can pull it up. I may have already deleted it from my phone because when I get frustrated, I delete things. Oh, I totally did. Okay, so we're not gonna go through my Lumen account because I removed it. That was when I was doing the rather lower carb process through working out. Well, let's just go through my yesterday. Ooh, yesterday was super fun. So I worked out fasted. I've been doing that a little more. I find that it's okay, except for on my ab cardio days. I absolutely, absolutely need to eat before that. Otherwise I get not okay. But on days where I'm just lifting, I do like a 15 minute warm up, just like dynamic stretching, that sort of thing. Then I jump on the treadmill and do like 15 minutes of like speed walking. And then I get going with my lifting. So it's probably like a full hour at the gym. And I find in the mornings, I don't need to eat before that. Yeah, so I worked out, I got home, I was so hungry. I did protein pancake mix from Simple Mills. I made waffles with this. Then I took some cooked chicken tenders. They were just like raw, you know, like chicken tenders, not with the breading, but just like raw chicken tenders are like my favorite. They're so much better than breasts. Like try it if you haven't. And then I crumbled those, like I cut that up really small and I put it on top of the waffles. And I put a little bit of maple syrup, like a teaspoon of maple syrup and a tiny bit of seven Sundays maple cereal. And I put that over top for that crunch. And I had chicken and waffles. It was so good. It was so good. And then I had some blueberries, just some fresh blueberries. So that meal came out to 53 grams of carbs, 15 grams of fat and 38 grams of protein. Then for lunch, Oh yeah, this was a really good lunch. I had arugula, pecans, olive oil, balsamic reduction, some more of those chicken tenders crumbled up. Some, yeah, then I had some ground chicken also in there, a little bit of chickpeas, some roasted beets, mix all that up to make a salad. And then on the side, I had a gluten-free bun. So overall, that was 60 grams of carbs, 28 grams of fat, and 42 grams of protein. Then for dinner, Oh, I made this ginormous Tuscan shrimp. Shrimp is so great when you're a volume eater and you just want to feel really full. It had like broccoli and spinach and garlic and coconut milk. It was so good and it it was so much food. And then I had like 100 grams of cooked and cooled potatoes because they're really high in res- resistant starch. The 29 grams of carbs, 14 grams of fat and 42 grams of protein. So you can see... At dinner time, I try to lower my carbohydrates just because I find if I'm fasted when I'm working out, I like to be like a little bit lower in carbs that evening. And I find that that works for me. At some point during that day, I don't remember when I had this exactly. I made a protein shake and it had frozen berries, uh, vanilla protein powder. I really like the pure paleo vanilla protein powder from Designs for Health. It's really good. Two tablespoons of ground flax and some collagen. Okay. So yeah, that was my day yesterday. So I still don't feel like that's overly crazy and I can totally do it. My macros for yesterday were 39% carbs, 
30% fat and 32% protein, 31% protein, sorry. So yeah, that's kind of what I'm doing now. I really wish that I still had my Lumen numbers so I could go through those because that's really when I was still doing keto. I find my favorite like high protein keto breakfast when I'm doing that is a huge, like ginormous omelet with a bunch of vegetables and like ham, or if it's like doing full keto, I'll do like bacon in there and nut butter with keto bread, like unbun bread is delicious. And I'll put some nut butter on there and then some salt. And that's like my default breakfast that I do a lot on my keto days when I'm not working out. So yeah, that's a little bit, a little bit. It's been 40 minutes. That's a lot of it about what I've been doing, how I've been eating. I hope something in there that I shared has been helpful to you at some point. Again, understanding that just because we're doing one thing now doesn't mean we're shifting it later. Keto is a tool that we're using. We're understanding, one, that it's resetting our metabolism, right? If you are just getting started with keto, do not go off keto. What I'm saying is you have to understand, I've been eating keto since 2014, Okay, that's nearly nine years <laughs> eating a ketogenic diet. My approach is going to be totally different than if you just got started. If you are not moving your body, then start moving your body. Don't change your macros. Once things get super heavy and you find like you're just flat, increase your protein, drop your fat a little bit, increase your carbs a little bit. Right now, I'm doing a lot of carbs only because my default is being deficient. And the last thing I want to do is lose my cycle. And so I found with my symptoms and how I was feeling, I was like, I'm going to try to increase my carbs and just see how things go, right? The worst that can happen with all of this is that I say, okay, that didn't work. I'm going to backtrack. I think what ends up happening for so many of us is we just keep pushing, 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 and our pride gets in the way. So I've been very prayerful around this of just uh, hoping that I notice these things as they're happening. And I am noticing it. I've noticed many, many things where I'm like, okay, that didn't work. Back to the drawing board. To just not have pride over this and understanding that just because I'm doing this now doesn't mean I'm going to do it like a week from now or two weeks from now. And keto, keto will always be my default. Like, yeah, this is fun for this 12-week program, but your girl is very much looking forward to it. I have like seven more weeks in this program, and then I'm going to go back to those macros previously of the 10% carbs, 25% protein, 65% fat, but I'm going to I'm probably going to change the protein a little bit, increase the protein, drop the fat a little bit, and I'm going to probably go up to like 2,300 calories. So that's kind of my next phase, right? So what I really want you to hear is like, Your macros are not something that you're hitting the same every single day, every single lift, every single moment of every single day for the rest of your life. I want you to hear that it's dynamic and it should be dynamic. But again, if you're just starting your ketogenic diet, don't make it dynamic. Keep it the same. Okay. Just keep it consistent. Get to moving, see how you feel, and then adjust from there. Okay. We have like a ton of questions. I doubt we're going to get through all of them. We're probably going to have to do another episode. If you like this series, let me know and we'll make more of them. And yeah, let's just dive in and we'll answer as many things as we can. So I stretch every day, but my flexibility has barely improved. I'm 55. Any tips for flexibility? Okay. Yes. You have to be so consistent with this. So if you are working out, you want to keep the stretches dynamic before you work out. So that means you're not holding a stretch. Okay. So you're like, ebbing and flowing, right? Before your workout, you don't want to hold a stretch. You don't want to go into a forward bend and sit there for 30 seconds. That's not what we want to be doing before we start lifting or before we start doing anything to do with movement. So you want to like keep a dynamic, right? So this isn't necessarily where you're going to be working on your flexibility. This is just like getting your muscles all warmed up and like less achy, right? It's amazing before a stretching session. Uh, Oftentimes my hamstrings will be really, really tight. And I know I'm ready to start lifting once my hamstrings aren't yelling at me anymore. Okay. So that's before your workouts. Then after your workouts, that's where you want to hold your stretches. Okay. So that's when you go into that deep forward bend and you just like sit there and revel in it. When you're sitting and holding those stretches, 
super important to breathe, like a count of up to 10, if you can make it, like breathe, breathe, breathe. And then it's an everyday thing. If you're finding like you're not getting that flexibility, you're not getting those adjustments that you want or the progress that you want, you might want to either A, find a stretch clinic to help you. I found that those were really helpful. I've not personally done it. I haven't needed to. I'm pretty flexible, but many of my clients have. I have some friends that do this and they love it. Another option that a lot of people forget about is chiropractic. I am always blown away. You know, sometimes I get out of the groove and I don't go to the chiropractor for a while. And then I go back. I'm like, oh, right. When I go here, I'm such a better person in so many ways, mentally and also just physically. It can really, really help with your flexibility also. So that could be something to to do. Okay, next question. What weights do you use in a small space? Girl, I got you covered there. So I started working out at home. My ceilings are six and a half feet tall. Okay, so not a lot of space. And then I have like a three foot wide space by about an eight foot wide space. And that is my space. So under my TV, there's probably a two foot space where I've put two kettlebells and three or four dumbbells. Okay, so that's really all you need. Maybe if you want, you could also get those exercise bands. Those are awesome and they do not take up a lot of space. So I have a very, very small space, very small space. Those barbells that allow you to adjust the weight, the tops come off and you take little metal pieces off and then you put the top back on. I find those to be super awesome because you can do like from like two pounds up to 12 pounds in one unit. And that's super, super, super helpful. And then if you're just getting started with working out, the Nourish Move Love exercises are great because all they use is dumbbells. So there's no like, now you need a bar and now you need this or that or whatever. And it's like, no, I don't have space for that. So then you just need to look for dumbbell only workouts. And I loved Nourish Move Love for that. Also, if you want, you could even just do kettlebells and get three different kettlebells. They do take up less space and you could do like every workout with a kettlebell. There are tons of workouts online you can get for free on YouTube. I have YouTube premium, best purchase I ever made because it doesn't have the ads in the workouts and you can download the workouts. So if you're like on vacation, we went on a vacation recently and I downloaded all the workouts. This was a while ago, actually. I downloaded all the workouts. So I had them when we were on our vacation and I could do them at the gym that was there. Everybody says that when you start a ketogenic diet and the further you get into your ketogenic diet, the more free from hunger that you are. I never really experienced that. Yeah, there have been times where I just haven't felt like it. And for sure, I can fast longer than I could ever be in glucose field. I've been keto off and on since 2014, primarily spending about 70% of my time in a state of ketosis. And I can tell you my snack game is just as strong as it was when I was fully glucose fueled. The only difference is that I crave meats and fats. Whereas before I could be found with maybe a little bag of popcorn or some sort of sweets. I really liked jelly bellies. So I don't think my snacking will ever change, but definitely the quality of the products and just the structure of what I'm eating has definitely shifted. I will always have a bag of macadamia nuts or a protein bar or paleo valley sticks in my purse. Now, I really love their beef sticks. I am obsessed with their garlic summer sausage. All of my friends know that the way to my heart is through a paleo valley meat stick, and many of them stock them in their homes. So when I go over, I have a snack. It is so sweet. Now, paleo valley just released their pork sticks, their maple bacon flavor. I've had the chance to polish off two full bags of them. I can tell you that they are absolutely delicious. So tasty. If you want to give them a try, just go to paleovalley.com and check out all their snacks and drinks. 
They have a list of their pork sticks. They also have a link to their grass-fed beef sticks, which I am in love with. Their superfood bars also are pretty darn good. So again, that's paleovalley.com. Use the code KETO. Once you've loaded up your cart, KETO, the coupon code, will give you 15% off your first order of beef sticks or pork sticks or superfood bars. Anything you can find on there is 15% off with the code KETO. Okay, next question. We touched on this a little bit. I remember you mentioned that you lost your period from hit style workout. What changed? Okay, so I covered this a little bit in that I was not eating. I was pushing too hard. And again, my calories were like super low and I was doing too much of it. I noticed with the Nourish Move Love workouts, which is why I stopped doing them and moved over to more lifting solo is because like almost everything was hit. Even if they said it was a strength workout, it ended up being a hit workout because you just didn't stop. And it was like a lot of cardio and just too much. So that was a limitation that I had. Now, for some people, you might be like, yeah, that sounds awesome. Let's do it. I just know that that's what caused issues before. So let's not repeat it. So over the last couple of weeks, I've noticed my sleep And I know that sometimes as you start working out, you have more energy and therefore you need less sleep, but it's something that I'm really serious about. So I was saving up money for a little while. I just ordered a aura ring using, have you guys used that Affirm loan situation online? So cool. So I agreed to purchase an aura ring and that's coming soon. And I'm really excited to see how my sleep is actually doing. Because I've been going to bed at like 9 or 9.30 and I'll wake up at like 5.30 or 6 ready to go. And that's unlike me. And I just want to make sure that everything is on point there. So I have noticed that my sleep, I'm having good sleep. I wake up refreshed. I have lots of energy throughout the day. I just don't want to crash. So I was like, hey, I just want to make sure everything's good on this front. So I ordered an aura ring. It should be here next week, hopefully. And then I can get to monitoring my sleep a lot better and just determining what my HRV is when I'm ready to work out and just being being held accountable more. I think it's so cool. So when I didn't have a period, wasn't getting my period back, was in a real bad place mentally, emotionally, physically, all the things, that was when we didn't really have technology to tell us information. Okay, so I've noticed that my sleep, though I'm having great sleep, I'm waking up rejuvenated. It's just unlike me to just wake up and get going with the day. And so that is an area that I definitely want to focus on. I am still having a period. It's so cool. It is so cool. After detoxing mold, how nice my periods are now. There was a period of time where it was really painful. But now, actually, I just got my period this morning while I was lifting. Super great. I was like, yay, cool. You couldn't have literally come like 30 minutes ago. So I knew that you were going to be here. Thanks. But yay, you're here. So it's, you know, it's always mixed emotions. So that's what I'm doing right now. Eating a lot. Trying not to let pride get in the way, which I think will, will go a long way if I can stick to it. Is it best to work out fasted is the next question. So ah, I go back and forth on this. Like sometimes your schedule just doesn't allow you to work out, like to work out with food in your belly. And sometimes it's not best for your body. And other times you need to work out with food in your belly. So what I found for myself personally is on my abs and cardio day, I need to work, like I need to eat before. It is such a bad idea to go in fasted and do an hour of cardio and then abs. It's just not possible. For my cardio, I split it between two machines and I keep my heart rate around 130 beats per minute. For me, I find that that's where I feel best. If I go beyond that, it's just pushing too hard and I just can't for right now. And so that's not like a deep cardio for me. I think really good cardio would be around 150, but I'm just not there yet. And so that's what I'm doing. And so I think, is it best to work out fasted? That's really a personalized question. If I didn't have a job and I could work out whenever I wanted and do whatever I wanted, this is how I would outline my day. Uh, I would wake up. I would probably like go into the sauna first thing in the morning every other day. 
after I drank a bunch of water and then I would have like a cold shower and then take my dog for a walk. And then I would have a really big breakfast and then I would read and then maybe like have a nap (laughs) and then have some lunch, maybe sunbathe, read some more and then go to the gym. Our cortisol is best in the afternoon for working out. Anytime between like two to four o'clock generally is when we will probably perform the best and have the best outcomes. So yeah, if you could work out at that time, it'd be great. It's really hard to do that. I try, but I fail most of the time. So there's that. And, but I don't think it's necessary. Okay. So if you're fasting to then eat less throughout the day, and you have a really intense workout schedule, probably not a great idea because to be in that massive deficiency while you're working out, that's like the big piece that we didn't really touch on. And I'm glad you asked this question. You don't want to be in such a massive deficiency that you're clearly not eating enough. I still think like my 2077 calories, I think is still a little bit low for what I'm doing. I'm trying to get my stomach. If you guys remember, I I talked about H. pylori a little while ago in episode 405 from January. I'm through that, I think, but I still have like a little, I I never want to experience stomach issues. And so I'm taking it a little bit slowly to increase. Like I said, my plan over the next like seven-ish weeks is to increase my calories, increase my fat, lower my carbohydrates. So that's kind of like where I'm headed. And so because my state is a deficient state, again, understanding where you're coming from, I'm better off eating more and being like, oopsie, I ate too much than eating less and getting into hot water. Whereas if you're coming from an excess state, you might actually do best working out fasted and being in a deficient state. Just making sure that you're not so deficient that your body starts down-regulating your metabolism because that's not going to help you at all. And it's going to make a mess of absolutely everything and you will regret it, right? So if you're like, hey, uh, working out... At 1,600 calories is great. I feel great. Let's go down to 1,400. No, you have a base metabolic rate, okay? You need to be able to be eating those calories at least plus your activity. So take some time, open up some macro calculators, use a whole bunch of them, figure out your resting metabolic rate or your base metabolic rate, use a couple calculators, get that base, and then add on top of that and be responsible, Okay, like this is your responsibility. Be responsible with this amount and stick to it. If you're currently eating 1,200 calories and you're like, Leanne, but if I eat more, I'm going to gain weight. It's because your metabolism is broken. I've been there. I've done it. I've had to do refeeds multiple times in my life to get my metabolism up to the point where I can even eat 2,000 calories consistently. There was a time where I was eating a lot more than that just to regulate my metabolism Okay, so you're hearing from me over years and years, like over a decade of working with my body and discovering what works, what doesn't, what ebbs and what flows. And everything that you're learning is in your toolkit. That's what's so cool about it. So I hope that that helps. How to work out during your cycle, when to do hit, when to do training, what are the best rest days? Okay, so just topically, and we can get into more of this in a moment, Topically, when you wake up and you're just like exhausted and can't even, that's your rest day. Congratulations. Like the schedule goes out the window. You are not going to work out that day. So there's a difference between making up excuses like I don't have time today or there's just too much going on or like I can't even to like actually physically not being able to do it. Right. Big, big difference. So then we get into the phases of workouts and how to support your body through movement. So let's talk about that. Days one to two, usually good to take it easy, like restorative practices, gentle walking. Don't be put like you can push it if you've got it, but if you don't got it, it's okay. In the follicular phase ovulation, it's more endurance energy. So like running, dancing, hiking, cycling, like longer periods, uh, like longer periods of working out. Days three to five, your heart rate is less affected. So you'll be better able to like stay in a fat burning state. You're going to have lower estrogen, which means you're less prone to injury. (laughs) The higher the estrogen gets, the more we're prone to injury. Okay. So if you know that you have estrogen dominance, then you need to be careful with working out because the excess estrogen is going to make your body more susceptible to getting injured. 
day seven to 12, the estrogen starts to increase, which means that your, your muscles are going to be less pliable. So to go back to that question about flexibility, if you are noticing that you're just not flexible and like the pliability of your muscles is just terrible, then it could be that you have estrogen dominance. So good to check into that. Day 7 to 12, because of that less pliable situation, you definitely want to warm up properly. You'll have more inspiration and motivation during this time. It's a great time to try new activities, mix up your usual routine. If you're thinking about trying a new program, days 7 to 12 are usually going to be best. Then days 13 to 15, around that ovulation time, you definitely want to be warming up properly. You are going to have high energy, good intensity. You're going to want to socialize. Your hair is going to look nice. Your face is going to be all lit up and glowy. And this is the time to like spend time with friends, go to a spin class with a friend, do like vigorous classes and like really get into it. Then we hit more of the, well, the luteal phase. So this is the time for like strength. Okay, so the first part is endurance. The second part is strength. So like heavy lifting, hit, sprinting, jump squats, box jump, box jumps, like just just like high intensity sort of things. But the endurance decreases. So your heart rate is going to be more affected by your workouts. You will reach fat burning zone a lot quicker and you'll quickly go into cardio zone. So it's important to check your heart rate in there. And you really want to pay attention to your water intake. Usually your requirement will go up because your progesterone is increasing and progesterone will then increase your core temperature, which then requires more water. Okay. So that's usually when you're going to be drinking more. So don't be surprised like days three to 12, if you're just like not drinking a lot and you keep forgetting your water. Yeah. It's because your body, your body temperature is lower. And then days 24 to 28, your hormones at ups and downs will make you feel sluggish. Oh man, did I feel that this month. Like a couple of days ago, I was at the gym and I was like, I don't think I can do my workout today. And I went to do a regular lift that I do all the time and I couldn't even lift up the weight. I was like, okay, we are going to do something else. And so I just did really low weight, like multiple reps instead of heavy weight. This is the time where you're going to taper off, take it easy, swim, bike, that sort of thing. Just chill. So I hope that that was helpful. I kind of just went through the whole cycle. And so maybe I did way too much than what you were asking, Um, but there you have it. Okay. We have time for one more question. Oh my goodness. We've gone over an hour. This never happens. Can walking in nature provide significant health benefits or is it not rigorous enough? Oh, Walking in nature is by far the best thing you could ever do for your body, hands down. It's right up there with drinking enough water and getting enough sleep. So if that is your activity for the day, that is what you're doing for your movements, a billion percent, without a doubt, a hundred percent, a billion percent, did I say a billion percent, do that? Yes. Yes. Deep breathing. You know, even not even having like a podcast or anything in your ear, just like being in nature with the noises and the sounds, I already said sounds and noises, and just like soaking it all up is by far the healthiest thing. I know that there's a reason why. Does it have to do with like serotonin? I read a study recently, but I can't remember. I know also it helps with circadian rhythm. I know that when I walk outside and I have just the fresh air in my lungs, I sleep way better. Maybe you've had that experience too. Okay, that's today's episode. We didn't get through a lot of questions. You know what? I'll probably just do a solo episode with all of your questions. So if you have more questions, you want to like talk with me about what we're covering on the show, any questions about macros or things that I can cover in the next episodes of the series, uh, definitely let me know. If you have more questions about the keto training aspect, um, definitely let me know. I've done this for quite some time. I can pretty much answer most things. And if I can't, I will find the answer. So yeah, that does it for another episode of the Keto Diet Podcast. Thanks so much for hanging out with me. I hope you have a great rest of your day and that something I shared here has been helpful for you. Bye. Thanks for listening. Join us next Tuesday for another episode of the Keto Diet Podcast. Looking for more resources? Go to healthfulpursuit.com for keto meal plans, weight loss programs, low-carb recipes, and oodles of free resources to get you going. 
The Keto Diet Podcast, including show notes and links, provides information in respect to healthy living, recipes, nutrition, and diet, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Keto Diet Podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without any representation or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program. 